evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And I, I, I see that we have a very good audience from all over the world. And it's a pleasure to have you all with us uh, at this evening's event that we're, being, we're hosting here at the Center for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery. My name is Matthew Smith. I'm the director of the center. And for those of you who may not know what we do at University College London, our center, we started in 2009 out of a project that was called the Legacies of British Slave Ownership. That was a central project of public history. Fundamental to that project was an investigation into race making and the connection of slavery to the development of modern Britain. A fundamental part of that has been the study of the compensation <laughs> money that was paid to British slave owners at emancipation. The, the uh, center of that work is the database that we've had uh, at the center coming out of that project for several years now, the Legacies of British Slave Ownership Database. And it has over 60,000 names of people connected in some way to British slavery. And I invite those of you unfamiliar with that database, please do uh, find some time and go on our website. It will lead you straight to the database and you would see uh, the vital importance of that work. Out of that project, we developed as a center. And as a center, we've been very much focused on issues of public engagement and also of building out from the work of the Legacies of British Slave Ownership Project. And a lot of that focus has been especially on the uh, lives and experiences of enslaved people in the British Caribbean and the ways in which the afterlives of slavery affected their descendants there as well as in metropolitan Britain, which is one of the reasons that I'm very, very pleased to have my dear colleague Suzanne Francis Brown presenting her work to us this evening. Suzanne's work both professionally and practically has been very much engaged with that project of centering the lives of enslaved people, but more importantly, I would say, making sure that their memories and the ways in which the, the descendants and the experiences afterwards, after slavery ended, is actually a part of the story we tell of this massive system that lasted for centuries of uh, inhuman bondage. Just once again, I'm very, very grateful to Suzanne for her willingness to share her work with us uh, at the center and to our broader community that's connected to CSLBS. And I now turn things over to my colleague, Dr. Jess Hanna, who is the project administrator at our center, who will introduce Suzanne. Jess? Thanks, Matthew. Um, and good evening, everybody. Um, uh, yes, so the Center for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery uh, is delighted to welcome Dr. Suzanne Francis Brown um, to deliver today's public lecture. Um, Suzanne is an independent historian and founding curator of the University of West Indies Museum, where she's been an honorary research fellow since 2019. Um, her research interests involve questions of heritage interpretation, historical archaeology, and reclaiming knowledge of underrecognized populations in Jamaica's um, historical space, including the colonized and the enslaved. Her early exploration of the Papine and Mona estates in St. Andrew Parish, Jamaica, was one of her was one focus of her first monograph, uh, Mona Past and Present, the History and Heritage of the Mona Campus, published in 2004. Since then, she's continued to pursue absences in the landscape with research spearheaded by the Digital Archaeological Archive of Comparative Slavery with the Department of History and Archaeology at the University of West Indies. Um, her most recent monograph titled World War II Camps in Jamaica is forthcoming from the UWI Press. Um, today's talk is based on her current project um, and we're very much looking forward today to hearing it and engaging with Suzanne about her research in the Q&A session afterwards. Let's um, turn this down, hold on. Suzanne, um, are you are you able to unmute yourself? Is that better? Yes, I think that works now. Okay, Great. thank you so much. 
All right, so thanks so very much to Dr. Matthew Smith and to Jess for that um, introduction and to the staff in general of the Center for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery at University College. Uh, I also wanna give thanks to the University Museum through which I maintain a research connection with the University of the West Indies, uh, which actually now in its present form overlays Papine and another adjacent estate, Mona estate in St. Andrew. And I, of course, want to thank the audience uh, for coming and for your kind attention. So one of the legacies of British slavery is the obliteration of individual histories for millions of individuals who were classified as chattel or movable property torn from their life contexts and mostly relieved of their given names upon crossing the middle passage between Africa and the Caribbean. Yeah. So, These disoriented individuals were for generations considered the private business of those who enslaved them and who as a group valued them only for their labor. Hence in Jamaica, in the frequent absence of private or corporate ledgers, records and correspondence generated by property owners of the time, the majority of these enslaved individuals over decades and centuries were lost to history. Until the early decades of the 19th century, following the end of the transatlantic trade in, in, the, in enslaved Africans, and for years preceding the abolition of slavery itself, when public records began to take regular account of enslaved people, our familiarity is only with those who tore through the fences. My interest is in contributing to a representation of the historic space, which acknowledges these people who have been obliterated, as well as those who had the power to make that space. In this, I resonate with some of the work on the UCL Legacies of British Slavery blog, and with the following statements that I recently found on that space. One is a statement by Katie Donington, who references the racial power imbalance of historical representation as seen in an absence of available material on the lives of enslaved people. And she was writing about slavery and the Bank of England under the title of Exploitation on Display. And Matt Stallard, who is another of the team at the UCL, in, a, in a, a blog on the Port Royal project that UCL presently has going, spoke about the importance of curating people's biographies and presenting them and therefore facilitating their reclamation and assimilation into historical memory. So in this presentation, my focus is on people enslaved on one medium-sized estate, the Papine estate, within the parish of St. Andrew on the outskirts of the city of Kingston, a major port and eventually the capital city of the island of Jamaica. The estate's ownership during the period is well established. However, no estate records or correspondence have been located. Hence, while we can identify a significant amount of information on the Wildman family that owned the estate from the 1780s, the enslaved labor force remained largely invisible until 1817, when all slaveholders across the island were required to make a comprehensive return of all the people they had enslaved with details relating to name, place of origin, whether Africa or island born, Creole, color, age, and maternal connection. In the aftermath of the abolition of uh, Britain's transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans, this was an effort to prevent the illegal acquisition of more enslaved laborers via other countries which had not um, ended the slave trade. While hence enumerating the population and then requiring the triennial returns that would state, date and explain any increase and decrease in the populations. These slave returns, which I will refer to as such, would be compiled as the slave registers of the former British colonial dependencies. And some of you may well have accessed some of these uh, which are available on Ancestry.com, among other places. Beyond the slave returns, and also important to efforts at reclamation, 
would be those instances where enslaved people appeared in the parish registers of the Church of England, then the established church in Jamaica and other British Caribbean territories, and which recorded baptisms, marriages, and burials for those accessing these services. I will refer to these as church registers. The presence or absence of enslaved people in these records over time was affected by a dynamic mix of personal and institutional factors and decisions. Baptisms and marriages would also be recorded unevenly through the efforts of nonconformist missionaries. Uh, and such marriages would eventually be compiled as dissenter records within the church registers. Enslaved individuals or groups would also occasionally be re referred to in government correspondence and the documentation, and, I'm sorry, in government correspondence and documentation and in the print media, which carried runaway ads in the late 17 and 1700s and early 1800s, and later sometimes published reports of cases involving enslaved people as the laws changed to include the admission of evidence by enslaved persons. Additionally, the Papine estate and the policies and actions of its owners, of its owner, sorry, James Beckford Wildman, were the subject of extensive questions uh, during hearings of an 1831 British Parliamentary Select Committee. And this evidence is also on record. So my aim today, and I'll put them up so that they're fairly straightforward. My aim is to discuss how the obscurity of the enslaved population at Papine can be lightened, even in the absence of estate records, through an interplay of these public records, which various to capture the voice and policy of the slaveholder, as well as the personal actions, personal agency of the enslaved. So my approach will be to explore and introduce you to the Papine estate, and then to discuss the management approaches of James Beckford Wildman, who inherited the estate from his father, as testified before a select committee of the British Parliament in 1831, focusing particularly on the subjects of morality and more specifically marriage. Wildman, who was born in Jamaica, was an absentee for much of his ownership, but spent a year in Jamaica between 1824 and 25, and then two plus years from 1826 to 29 in an effort to address economic downturn on his estates, Papine and St. Andrew, as well as low ground in the parish of Clarendon and Salt Savannah in the parish of Vere, the latter two many miles to the west of Kingston. And then the third thing I hope to do is to share the outcome of a search for marriages on the Papine estate, which enabled the illumination of both nuclear and extended families on the estate during the second half of the 1820s. So I start with the location of Papine. And you'll see here on the map, the, there's a map of Jamaica up, and there's also to the right, a map of the parish of St. Andrew. And the Papine estate falls in the area that I have pointed to just below the N in Andrew and close to the Mona estate, adjacent in fact to the Mona estate, which is actually listed uh, on these maps where Papine actually doesn't show up. And this is partly because Papine was eventually subsumed within Mona late uh, in the second half of the 19th century. And then what I want to do is to take you closer in on the estate. And so what we have here in the, in the larger image is the center of the estate from a map of 1834 by Robert Gore Jr., a survey of the, of the map of the estate. So the Papine estate in St. Andrew was around a thousand acres. It ranged from about 900 and something up to about 1200 and something over time. And it was positioned between the similarly sized Mona estate to the south and the much larger Hope estate to the north. Drawn together from smaller plots in the mid 1700s, the estate came to Englishman James Wildman through his wife, Joanna, who inherited it from her father. A survey map drawn in 1834 by Robert Bohr Jr. shows major built features of the estate set in the relatively flat landscape with most of the cane fields, some 357 acres, to the west of the works. 
Some 134 acres was in common pasture, around 196 acres in guinea grass and 470 acres in woodland, with another 45 acres described as woodland and provision grounds. And the provision grounds were where the enslaved population would have grown most of their food. There was around 10 acres devoted to the great house and gardens. And I'm just, I'm not sure if you can actually see my cursor, but this, uh, area is the great house over here, the, the structure to the right. Um, so there were about 10 acres devoted to the great house and gardens on which Lady Nugent, the wife of the governor of Jamaica around the turn of the 19th century, had lavished praise in her diary, though she was very unimpressed with the owner's house, as was Wildman himself. The works yard with its water mill, boiling and curing house and distillery, and that, those are the southern three structures with the, the mill being at the top, uh, were set in around eight acres. And it was just to the north of the mill around the cut stone and brick aqueduct, which runs all the way through the blue line that runs all the way through the structure, the, through the map. It was around this area uh, that the, the I'm sorry, I've just lost myself, but I know what I'm talking about. Um, it was around the cut stone and brick aqueduct and within easy sight of the overseer's house, which we see over here on the, on the left or to the west, uh, that the estate village was located. The bar plaque details 19 individual units scattered along both sides of the aqueduct with a population that varied between 187 and 222, 227 people over the period, one can assume that the number of units is indicative rather than actual. However, it is possible to speculate that these might also have represented family compounds. Both archeological and historical work on other estates has suggested the presence of compounds where single dwellings of various sizes were clustered within a common fence. An archeological survey at Papine was carried out between 2008 and 2011 by the university's history department and the Digital Archaeological Archive of Comparative Slavery DAX with involvement of the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. And while it wasn't sufficiently detailed to propose house or compound locations, analysis of the finds did suggest changes in the lives of the enslaved population through time, including clear evidence that the earliest habitations in the estate village had been on the western side of the aqueduct within direct view of the overseer and other managers, but that these dwellings gradually spread beyond the aqueduct to the east where the surveillance was less direct. And you can actually see that even in the representation in the 1830s, there are more structures on the eastern side of the aqueduct. A 2012 discovery of several for several, several bur burials in the area just north and west of the overseer's house. So that's the area around where um, the overseer's house is here. And this would be just to the north and, and west. Um, actually took place during some construction where they were there was building going on to put a new medical faculty building uh, at the University of the West Indies and some uh, some bones were discovered and led to the, the recognition that there were several burials in that area. And these present the possible location for an estate graveyard, though dating has not actually confirmed this. None of the survey maps of Papine or adjacent Mona estate identifies a graveyard. The fragments of bones collected in the 12, 2012 location were later inurned and a memorial was raised over the site. And the, the uh, memorial text is, is shown from the plaque on the top left. One of the, I, I just put up some other images here that are relevant and, and they're just really to give you a little bit, bit more of a sense of this space. So there is an image to the bottom, uh, towards the bottom left of the aqueduct, which remains and stretches and is a major um, structural element of the historical element of the UWI campus site, stretching right across part of the Papine estate and then the Mona estate. 
that aqueduct fed the Hope Estate, the Papine Estate, and the Muna Estate with water from the Hope River. Uh, there's also an image of the Aki trees, which are one of the botanical markers. Uh, many orchard trees are considered botanical markers of, of slave sites uh, because of their food potential. And the Aki trees, a number of Aki trees continue across this landscape. Um, the, the map at the base is really just to give an indication of how close the Papin and Mona sites are and really very, very easy walking distance from one village to another, though I haven't actually identified any specific relations, relationships, um, any records relating to relationships between the two estates. And then the image on the bottom right is an image of the one of the slave, slave return, one of the books of slave returns, the registers, which are such an important element of uh, our being able to find out more about the people who lived here. Prior to the 1817 slave returns, which I've mentioned, there are only a few global population totals for Papines and slave population. There were 187 people at the time when a list was given for St. Andrew Estates in 1783. And then regular totals were submitted to the parish vestry each March for the assessment of poll tax. And these were published annually in the Jamaica Almanacs between 1811 and 1833. Compared to this 1783 figure, the numbers were higher in 1809, perhaps reflecting an increase to cushion the impact which estate owners expected from the 1807 end to the transatlantic trade. It's likely that the 1809 figures reflected, it is unlikely that the 1809 figures reflected natural increase on the estate. And this was a chronic challenge around Jamaican estates where most enslaved people were affected by brutal work regimes, poor food, and high exposure to disease. By 1817, women far outnumber men in the Papine population, and Creoles or Jamaican, Jamaican born individuals constituted three quarters of the community, with one quarter born in Africa, proportionately far more of them among the men than among the women. Genealogical analysis of the available records excavated from the public domain tend to may tend to suggest a deeply rooted Creole population at Papine. The uptick in the population in 1821 through purchase of 45 persons from another St. Andrew plantation, Summer Hill, brought the Papine community a quite different population, one where all the mature adults were Africans and all children and young adults were Creole with evidence suggesting at least some nuclear families. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that shortly. So first I want to introduce you to James Beckford Wildman. James Beckford Wildman is this gentleman in the picture, oh, I'm sorry, the picture on the left, the black and white image, his father, James Wildman, who owned the estate until his death uh, in 1816, is shown at the, at the top right of the image. And these are from the Chillum Castle site because Chillum Castle in Kent was the location where the Wildmans um, made their family home, as I'll explain in a moment. So James Beckford Wildman, the eldest son and heir of James Wildman's, to James Wildman's three Jamaican estates, was born in St. Andrew, presumably at Papine, and his, his birth record is shown there. Uh, and he remained there until 1796, when the family relocated to England, where James Wildman had purchased Chillum Castle in Kent. While it is not clear how many, we know the Wildmans did take enslaved people with them when they left Jamaica. Later testimony refers to a man born in England around 1798 at the Wildmans Bedford Square property, who was returned to Jamaica as a slave and later freed by Wildman, who employed him as a carpenter at Papine with right of residence. That man, his name was James George Doe, lived at Papine during the period from 1817. So did his enslaved mother, Charlotte Richards, who would have gone with the Wildmans to England. And so did Clorinda Smith, the enslaved woman who became mother to at least two enslaved children given the surname of Doe, was, which was completely um, unusual name in the estate population. The testimony that J.B. Wildman gave to the Parliamentary Select Committee on the extinction of slavery throughout the British Dominions in 1831 
was widely reported and variously interpreted. He was one of more than two dozen witnesses and I, uh, the, the um, frontispiece of the report and the list of witnesses is on the slide. He was one of more than two dozen witnesses and was extensively questioned on his estates and his perspective on not just the capacities of his and other enslaved people, but also his assessment of their likelihood to continue laboring on sugar estates as their masters desired, if emancipated. Wilburn's perspective was complicated. He asserted a moral perspective, terming himself a very zealous member of the established church, but also willingly criticized church officials, uh, as well as immoral whites, including many estate functionaries. He favored and instituted improving working conditions on his estate when he visited his estates in 1824 and when he returned for two years in 1826. Part of that was simply because he wanted, he was hopeful of an increase in uh, a in natural increase in the population on his estates. But he also was interested in a better working environment. But though many considered him an abolitionist, Wildman wished to ensure continued labor on his estates. And he came to recognize that unlike Barbados, where emancipated workers would have little option but to continue working on the estates, emancipated workers in Jamaica would have options, especially given that there was plenty of empty land. Wildman's solution, as he told the select committee, was to ameliorate conditions, uh, but legally require continued slavery. Quote, govern them by mild and equitable laws and to let them feel all the benefits of freedom without the name. Asked to state what improvements he had favored, Wildman stated, quote, the admission of slave evidence is now affected, effected. That was most material for the life of the slave was in the hands of the master before. I would totally put an end to trafficking on Sunday. The Sabbath should be kept as far as the law was concerned. Then instead of the Sabbath, I would give them another day for the master now has the whole of the seven days. If the slave does not work on the Sunday, he starves. I would give him a day instead of his Sabbath so that it might, it might be left to himself to keep the Sabbath. I would provide for the establishment of paid magistrates because I conceive it absolutely necessary that the magistracy should be persons unconnected with the island and in that case, the slave would get redress. And that's the end of that quote. So um, part of what is put before the select committee is that Wildman uh, had made a number of peculiar what, or what, what his attorney, uh, James um, William Taylor, called peculiar privileges that were given to persons enslaved on the estate. And so Wildman did seek to implement some of the ideas that he mentioned. Planting attorney William Taylor, who oversaw Wildman's estate for two years from 1829, described some of these most peculiar privileges on the Wildman estate. Quote, Mr. Wil Mr. Wildman's Negroes had 52 Saturdays in the year by his own indulgence, as they were expected to attend divine service on Sunday. And in order to take away all excuse for them working on Sunday for food, he gave them every Saturday in the year. That gave them a great deal of additional time, unquote. This was a significant extension of the 26 weekdays, since Saturday counted as a weekday, which was allowed by law. Additionally, Taylor said no night work was permitted on Wildman's estates during crop. He continued, he completely discontinued the flogging of women and discouraged the use of the whip as a, a regular means of correction on his estates though he said it should still be carried. And he pursued the education of children and the moral instruction of his enslaved population. So I just want to briefly touch on some of the evidence available with regard to these uh, particular areas, um, natural increase education, and then the moral life or marriage, which Milburn favored or pursued and which were acknowledged in testimony by William Taylor, who uh, I might add, Wildman later, fired for poor management, which included taking amelioration too far on his estates. So in terms of natural increase, and I've put up some of the quotes, um, some of them I, I don't um, give all of them, but I've put them up for your interest. These are the quotes from the select committee uh, of 1831. So with regard to natural increase, 
with respect to the impact of uh, the ban on flogging women and night work, Wildman said that he, he was finding that there were increased births on his estate, though he acknowledged that this went along with increased deaths. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's a hard read. So he says, uh, that I think is most satisfactorily accounted for in this way. In the first place, the births being greater, the loss of children, of course, from casualties must be greater. And during infancy, they die in spite of all our endeavors." And unquote. Uh, the second quote that's up there, and I, I won't read it, uh, relates to, to William Taylor's uh, take on it, which essentially is that it would appear that there was an increase a natural increase um, or an increase in natural increase on the estate as a result of Wildman's policies, though he had left uh, Wildman's employ before he could see uh, whether it would actually come to something. So that was the first area I just wanted to touch on very briefly, and we can come back to it if we have the time. The second was the area of education. Uh, these are the proceedings of the Church Missionary Society. Uh, which was um, an offshoot of the Anglican Church. Immediately on returning to England early in 1825, after a year in Jamaica, Wildman contacted the Church Missionary Society and offered his estates as locations for missionary teachers and schools. The first two were deployed, one at Papine in 1826, um, and they're the first in Jamaica. The first CMS report after their arrival indicated that 15 boys and 19 girls were receiving instruction. And I've put on the left-hand side uh, the 1826 and then the subsequent 1827-28 um, uh, numbers, but, I will, but I'll also refer to them. The, the following report for 1827-28 said that 64 children were receiving instruction in shifts of whom 30 could read the scriptures fluently. Adults were also offered instruction after work, though they did not attend regularly. Sunday prayer and teaching were also offered. Wildman was determined that moral instruction must include literacy. Unlike many local planters who discourage religious instruction and especially any that involved literacy. And this, uh, this this slide also gives uh, a sense of the, this next, the next slide will also give a sense of some of the response to Wildman's changes. Um, I, mentioned, I mentioned, before I go to that slide, I mentioned um, this Harriet Wildman, and I'll, I'll come back to Harriet Wildman very briefly, but she actually is referenced in one of the CMS proceedings as being, uh, somebody who, who had learned to read and, and begun to teach people. So here are a couple of the responses to Wildman's efforts. He himself testified uh, that as a result of his efforts to have formal instruction for his enslaved people, he was set forth in the papers, quote, as an enemy of the colony. I was told if I meant to burn down my own estate, I had no right to burn down those of others. And while he doesn't give the actual location, the Jamaica Courant, which was one of the newspapers of the time, appears to have had uh, quite a, an acerbic relationship with uh, James Beckford Wildman. So I think that's, that's very likely where that, that is. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to locate uh, any copies of the Courant, the Jamaica Courant for that time. So if anybody is aware of any that are still around, I would really love to know about it. And then uh, I also put up the testimony of Reverend John Barry, um, who was a Wesleyan missionary who was also um, who also was a witness at the select committee hearing. And while he didn't have uh, specific specific details or opposition, he did say that he was aware that uh, Wildman became very unpopular in Jamaica in consequence of his instruction. <laughs> his instruction of uh, his, his uh, enslaved people. Richard Dunn estimates that almost all of the slaveholders in Jamaica and other British islands strenuously opposed any program of religious instruction for their quote unquote heathen black workers 
and that the Anglican clergy in Jamaica sided with the slave masters since they supposed that Christianity was for whites only. As late as the 1830s, most of the Jamaican planters were outraged because Baptist and Methodist ministers were daring to spread the gospel, minister, the gospel message to the Africa Caribbeans. As Thomas de la Beche, a Wildman contemporary and Jamaican absentee, uh, who, whose estate, Hal's Hall estate, was in the, in the south center of, of the island, uh, also intimated this seems to have been widely the case despite some variation based on the perspectives of the individual clergymen. Robert Stewart, in fact, has described Wildman as, quote, the proprietor who set the pace for most others before emancipation in conciliating his workers through re religion. Uh, very pragmatic um, approach that he came to uh, and, and one which was um, widely commented on, but very differently interpreted. So I want to come to marriage, um, which, is, which is where we'll spend uh, the rest of the time that I have. First, I want to talk about Wildman's um, support for marriage, which followed from his broader moral position, one aspect to which he testified with disgust at the immorality that white managers displayed to the enslaved population. Another select committee witness, a missionary, suggested that the widespread practice of concubinage contributed to a managerial discouragement of marriage on some estates with enslaved people expected to, quote, live as we do. But many simultaneously criticized enslaved people for poor morals and lifestyles, especially blaming the women. De La Beche of the Hals Hall estate wrote in the 1820s that he, quote, could not prevail upon a single pair to, marriage, to marry during my residence among them, though constantly striving to overcome their prejudices. And he ascribed these to their African ideas, which led them to prefer poly polygamy and promiscuous intercourse to Christian marriage. He did anticipate that changing this would require them imbibing, quote, proper moral and religious feelings on the subject from the instruction of a Wesleyan Methodist minister whom he had recently engaged. Based on knowledge of Wildman's estates, attorney William Taylor suggested that men might be disinclined to marry while their wives could be flogged and exposed. Some proprietors were disinclined to accord legal rights to em uh, enslaved people, and these were potential, and there were potential implications for their capacity to separate persons who had been legally married and issues of access where married couples were on separate estates. Only after, sorry, originally only Anglican ministers could legally perform marriages and the regulation of marriage for non, by non-conformist ministers took some time. Pressures from the metropole stoked by the abolitionist lobby and Henry Atlink argues also by changes to marriage laws in Britain were met by resistance from the Jamaican assembly though some changes were codified in an amended slave law in 1826. Even with that law, which removed the fee for marriages for, by enslaved people, the requirement that the owner or manager should give permission for enslaved people to marry remained a requirement with passage of the abolition, until passage of the Abolition Act in 1833 and its implementation the following year. Uh, one of the in the examples that, we, that Wildman gives actually in, in testifying to the select committee actually speaks to his belief that religious instruction and moral suasion had led to an increase in marriages at Papine. And the example that he offers from his own experience during his 1824 sojourn was of a gardener who had been living with the mother of his several children and who had, quote, just taken another young girl by whom he had two or three children. I continue the quote, not very long after I went out, I endeavored to induce him to put this woman aside, conceiving that if I could not impress a man who had, was constantly about me and who I was seeing daily, it would be almost in vain to try it with the field Negroes. I found no difficulty after expostulating with them both. And the, the full quote is on the screen. In short, the, the gardener and his old wife were married as Wildman stated based on an account of the wedding received from his manager and the couple had continued to live together, quote, as far as I've been able to ascertain in a perfectly correct and strict state, unquote. And my, I, I really want to focus on the fact that I think actions speak louder than words. 
Wildman's assertions on marriages at Papine led me to search the Church of England registers for the pre-emancipation period. And these records can be rich sources of information despite the limitations inherent in their institutional nature. There was substantial variation among the parishes in Jamaica in what is recorded and where, which may relate to the particularities of the rectors and the parish officials. In this case, the search for marriages in St. Andrew provided returns that were an interesting match for William's assertions. During the 12 month period from May 1824 to April 1825, no fewer than 13 marriages, 12 of them for couples co-resident at Papine, while one included a free colored man, are recorded in the marriage registers of the Church of England for the parish of St. Andrew. This comprised 25 of some 220 men, women, and children then enslaved on the property. 10 of them were married between May and November and three more couples in the first quarter of 1825. For comparison on adjacent Mona estate, which was similar in size, there was one marriage as early as 1816, two in 1819, and one in 1824. James Beckford Wildman could have personally given the necessary permission for most, if not all of these marriages. He may have paid the requisite fees that up to 1825 were received by the priest for marrying enslaved as well as free people. It is possible that he underwrote some part of the celebration that one imagines would have followed the weddings, all of them on Sundays, and perhaps officiated on the estate by a priest from the parish church. Surely the wedded couple dressed for the occasion, enslaved people earned money from sales of surplus provisions and craft manufacturers, and the purchase of nice clothing, far outshining the coarse Osnabergs provided by the slaveholders, was mentioned by several contemporaneous observers, including De La Beche and also Wildman's Papine attorney, William Taylor, in his select committee testimony. Surely these weddings attracted attention from the friends and neighbors living in small Watland daub thatched buildings clustered around the brick and stone cut and cut stone aqueduct that bisected the estate and fed the water mill in the nearby sugar works in sight of the overseer's house. So what I want to do is I want to take you on a journey to find one of these. And these, this, this, what you see to the top left-hand side is one of the entries relating to two couples from the Papine estate. And I'm gonna focus on the second of them, Jackson G. O'Hagan and Kitty Robinson. So here is the challenge. The names on the marriage registers are baptismal names, Christian name and surname taken by the individuals. The register affirms that the individuals are enslaved at Papine. But how does that relate back to the admittedly slight history of their existence on the estate as reflected in the slave returns? To take this example that I've chosen, who are Jackson G. O'Hagan and Kitty Robinson? How old are they? What are their origins? Do they have parents, siblings, children? What work do they do? Though few people on Papine are identified by occupation in any of the records. Marriage in the church presupposed baptism. Hence the church registers for the parish of St. Andrew were also searched for names with connection to the Papine estate. And baptisms were found, which dated back as far as 1800, with most clustered around the 1816 to 17 period perhaps not divorced from the census, the first slave return being taken in mid 1817. For the Papine estate at least, most people who had been baptized before the end of June had those baptismal record names recorded on the 1817 return along with their old single quote unquote slave name. Providing a bridge across one genealogical chasm at least, the other and mainly uncrossable gap being the taking away of names and identities from across the middle passage. So some baptisms were located, but there were two obstacles. Again, at least in the St. Andrew registers, they only provide the new name and again, their state affiliation. And in an institutional decision from the beginning of 1818, the church decided to separate the baptism of the unfree from the free, whether white or colored in their registers. A notice written into the register at the start of that year stated that from thence, all slave baptisms were to be entered in a supplementary register book, not the regular book. Marriages also appear to have been separated as some 
as none appear for enslaved people for several years from 1826. These supplementary books for St. Andrew have not been located and appear not to have survived. The importance of the slave returns in relation to the identity of enslaved people and uh, its potential for reflecting some level of acceptance of Christian values was implied early on by planting attorney James Simpson in testimony to the same select committee that heard evidence from J.B. Wildman and William Taylor. He said the returns, slave returns, will show from the time that the Negroes began to take surnames, their baptism became general and Christianity may then be supposed to have been generally introduced according to the extent of the names, quote unquote. So the next step in finding the backstory of Jackson J. Hagan and his wife, Kitty Robinson, was to go to the slave returns. There are a few things to bear in mind here. The base census or return for 1817 listed everyone enslaved on each estate, name, origin, age, color, and for the children and sometimes older persons who had been on the estate a long time, their maternal connection. This was because legally, the status of the child followed that of the mother. Fathers were not identified, though they could sometimes be worked out once surnames entered. After 1817, Jamaican estate managers were required to report any increase or decrease in their population every three years, whether these were increases in birth, by birth or purchase, or decreases through death, transportation, sale, or manumission, with each detailed by name and year. There was no requirement to list anybody else, and it seemed that most owners did not. So neither Kitty nor Jackson were listed in the Papine 1817 return, but the name Geohegan suggested that at least one of them had been part of the group of 45 persons added to the Papine community in 1821 through that purchase from Summerhill and listed in the increase column of the triennial report for Papine in 1823. This return only listed single names, none of them being Kitty or Jackson. That could have been it. Name changes were not considered sufficient reason for a new listing as they related to personal identity and not to a change in the estate population. However, at Papine, the proprietor had decided to diversify his production and in so doing required fewer laborers at Papine. Hence over a period of three years, the 1829 and 1832 returns recorded the change of location of close to 100 persons from Papine, mostly to Wildman's low ground estate in Clarendon. For the most part, families were kept together, though there appear to have been instances where young adults were left behind while parents and younger siblings were relocated. There is testimony to extensive preparation for the move, including the building of new houses and the preparation of provision grounds to receive those moving. I found Kitty and Jackson in the 1829 return. And the, some of the snippets of that, of that return are on the bottom left. She's listed as Nelly, alias, A-L, alias are also Kitty Robinson, A-L, Jackson. He is Jack, A-L, Jackson, Geohegan. Working back, I found Nelly and Jack among the nine African men and nine African women who had come to Papine in 1821 from Geohegan's Summerhill Plantation in St. Andrew. I went looking for Nelly and Kitty's children and realized that the arrangement of the Geohegan group within the 1823 Papine return was unusual to say the least. In general, and the, the, the Summerhill return, the Summerhill 1820 return is on your left and the Papine return on the right. In general, slave returns are arranged with males and females separated and generally each group is roughly arranged with elders preceding youngers. Both the Wildman and Geohegan estates are gener have generally used this roughly conical approach, though I have seen at, one least, at least one approach use an alphabetical arrangement of the names male then female. But within the male and female sections of the Papine 1823 report, where the Geohegan ad additions were bracketed together, and that's these two areas that I've shown in light blue on, your, on the right, 
there was a subsidiary arrangement which further examination showed to represent family groups. And while fathers were not named, they were implied. Uh, the, basically the way in which, if you look at it, the way in which it is done is that you will see the name Jack, age 26, sorry, 36, African, Negro. Then you will see two children below him who are sons of Nelly. Then you will see another adult male African with two children below him who are children of Juliet. And it continues down, the, down through, through this section of the return like that. And the, the bottom section is the, the women and the top section is the men. And so in the, in the bottom section, you will see Nellie and then you will see be, below Nellie, her child, uh, Joan, who is 12 years old. And essentially what this does is it acts as a kind of Rosetta Stone in, in terms of showing the family structure that was actually brought in among these people who had come to Papine from Summerhill. And so what I did basically is, and I've, I've done it for all of them, but I've uh, shown you here for, as an as a example, is a family tree. I'm, there are some, some, uh, some things not 100% right with it, but never mind. This, the, correct, the information is correct. So this is uh, Nellie, also Kitty Robinson, also Jackson, and her eventually husband, um, Jackson Geohegan. Uh, and the, their children. Um, I've included Kwao or Tom, who is Nelly's son, by, I believe, uh, a gentleman called Dicky. But the rest of the children are, it would appear, are, are common to, to both, both before and after marriage. So using all the information available, this is the family that moved to Papine and had their structure formalized and legalized and then continued to grow and change while on the St. Andrew estate. One of Nelly's sons, as I mentioned, uh, is presumed to have been fathered by an African neighbor named Dicky, and he's included in the family tree. Similar trees have been developed for all the African-headed Geohegan families on the 1823 return. This propensity for nuclear families, especially among enslaved people born in Africa, has been discussed by Barry Higman in work on the slave family and households, as early as 18, uh, 1975. And it's interesting to find these, these examples uh, here at Papine. Additionally, an attempt has been made to find whatever information exists for other persons on the list of couples married between 1825, in May 18, I'm sorry, between May 1824 and April 1825. For those who have been confirmed, one interesting element relates to the naming of children. While the basis of decision cannot be certain, it is interesting to note that some took the surname of assumed fathers, some the first name, and some took neither. In the case of Jackson Geohegan, several of the children took the surname Jackson, as did his wife. It's tempting to speculate around the fact that the surname Geohegan was a direct reminder of a former slave master, and that while taken formally, it may have eventually died out from disuse. In the instance of another couple, John Gordon and Lucky Geohegan, who shared the same wedding day, four of the couple's children took the surname Gordon. One took Geohegan and one took Henry. Many parts of that decision-making process are undoubtedly unknown. So I'm just going back to the list of married couples for a moment. Among the 13 couples who got married in 1824 to 25, some identifications remain challenging. It isn't sure who the new names relate to but some have been identified through the 1817 and 1829 Papine returns, which made a point of noting individuals' own as well as new names. Those on the slide that have asterisks or degree signs have been firmly or provisionally identified. The asterisks identify those born in Africa and the degree signs identify those born in the West in Jamaica. Sam Stewart, the last person listed, uh, maybe the gardener to, who, to whom Wildman alluded and who got married, would have gotten married after Wildman returned to the UK, for the, to, to England for the first time. I would also like to mention Harriet Wildman, though her marriage to a free black man named John Francis did not occur until 1831 because she was one of the few members of the Papine community who out, uh, appear outside of the slave returns and church registers. 
She is also mentioned in a CMS record as star pupil and later pupil teacher at the Papine School. She had been assigned to serve the CMS couple who worked at Papine in 1826. Family trees developed for Creole families at Papine are deeper and often reflective of wider range of experience, as is the case of this one shown here, which sketches the limited life markers and connections of Elizabeth Smith, who was one of those married in, 18, in November of 1824. Uh, Elizabeth Smith married a free man named uh, John Pennington Smith. Uh, he's referred to by the, Brit by the church register as a free mulatto man, but looking at the or available baptismal records for people of that name, it sounds as though he may actually have been uh, black or what was called termed sambo or three quarter black at that, at that point. Um, and, and that's one of the issues with using some of the records because uh, a lot of it depends on the, on the perceptions of the rectors um, who are making these, these judgments and who are writing these records. There are a number of things that we could go into in relation to this particular one. You can see that it is a deeper record. Uh, Patty Williams, who is Elizabeth Smith's mother, was herself Creole. Uh, and some of the persons who were still within the, the Papine population as far along as are coming up to abolition uh, had been there for a very, very long time. They, there are a number of things that also relate to issues like, um, not, not on this particular one, but there are two more, two more family trees that I've been able to develop for the part of the Creole population at Papine, which include um, women who were having relations over, across two generations with persons, white people working at Papine. And you can actually see that by the names and to some extent uh, by manumission. So in conclusion, Wildman sought or supported uh, ameliorated conditions for his enslaved laborers in part due to moral concerns, though his moral frame was one that would retain, retain subordination and he balked at emancipation, which would remove the requirement to work the estates and further threaten the profits of owners. Within that context, his focus was on some improvement in labor conditions and means of punishment, especially for women, on education, on a moral frame, including marriage. On the other side of the equation, the enslaved acted within the available context according to considerations which are not always clear, but no doubt in their interest. Improvements such as Wildman's forbidding the flogging of women on his estate and his encouragement of marriage would have joined with such wider contextual events as the admission of evidence from enslaved people and the ending of the surplus fee for marriages of enslaved people. Their actions such as claiming, claiming opportunities for baptism and marriage, hence taking names and surnames in which they had some say and using these to signal familial connections are reflected in various public records. Despite the absence of estate records, the interleaving of such records, hints and clues as exist, grant us an opportunity to help illuminate obscurity and reclaim lives and spaces, and in this instance, to gain an appreciation of the family lives of some among the community of enslaved laborers living on the Papine estate in St. Andrew, in the last decades before slavery was abolished. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, I think we'll all sort of applaud uh, virtually um, from our separate spaces. Um, thank you for that absolutely fascinating talk. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And I think there's, there's so much to kind of get into in the discussion. Um, we have some time now for uh, Q&A, so questions from anybody um, in the in the audience. Um, I think the best way to do this is probably if, if those of you who have questions, if you use the raise hand function um, at the bottom of the screen, um, and I will try to, uh, hopefully I'll be able to see that and I can get to you. Um, you can also put questions in the chat or you can kind of signal in the chat that you want to speak and then I can um, invite you to unmute yourself. Make sure that I can see everybody. 
while you're all kind of um, thinking of questions. Um, Dexnell Peters, I see you have your hand raised. Are you, are you able to unmute yourself? Great, thank you. Yes, hello. Hi, Suzanne. This is really interesting. I mean, learning so much more in particular about the uh, enslaved persons and Papine. I had just a quick um, question. I mean, I was really intrigued about hearing about Harriet Wildman and, you know, sort of being praised as you know, one of the kind of ideal recruits of this new education program happening in the late um, 1820s and so on, which of course is a time of amelioration and, but we're getting pretty close to, you know, the abolition of slavery. And of course we have the Sam Sharp rebellion. I just um, wondered if there's anything more you could tell us about Harriet Wildman, because I'm really intrigued about her increased form of literacy, learning to read and so on, and whether, I don't know, is there any more I imagine there might not be much that she's actually written, but if there's anything more said about her, did she have any views on the condition of slavery that was potentially recorded? You know, to what extent did she eventually contribute to debates about amelioration or even slavery? I don't know. I mean, it might be a lot, <laughs> um, but I was just curious about that. If you could share anything more about that. I, I, thanks Dex. I am. Um... It's, it's very tempting, you know, you, you kind of want to turn the pages back and, and ask the questions. Harriet Wildman is, is one of the few, uh, certainly among the, the married persons who, who I was in, you know, focusing on here, who is otherwise recorded. And as I said, um, she, she appears in the Church Missionary Society proceedings very, very briefly as, as a star pupil. And she is thereby uh, mentioned um, by Lucille Mayer in, in her look at, at women. Um, but we don't have any record of what Wildman says. And, you know, it, I think it, it really relates a lot to, to who is proselytizing at various places. Because, for instance, um, there is a a wonderful book by um, Maureen Warna Lewis looking at a man called Monteith, Archibald Monteith from St. Elizabeth, I think it is, uh, who was one of the Moravian converts and who, whose voice is actually recorded by the persons who, uh, you know, in, in that church situation. And so we are able to get a, a far deeper appreciation of who this person is and where he's coming from and so on. With Harriet Wildman, we don't have that. What we basically have, and I, I do have her, I have worked out uh, one of these brief family trees. Uh, what I do have for her basically is her, her baptismal record. Uh, I have, I know who her mother is. I know who her siblings are. Uh, and and basically their very brief stories and the fact that she marries um, a free black man in 1831 uh, while still enslaved um, and as far as I know continues at Papine uh, but we don't we don't have anything more and in the absence of even the Papine registers we are we are guessing the, one of the one of the challenges I was mentioning things like the the issue of color in relation to John Pennington Smith who marries Elizabeth Smith, but for instance in terms of um, age, that's another thing that there are so many discrepancies for, and sometimes you'll find a reference to someone, and the baptismal record gives some gives one, and the, the slave return gives gives another, and it, there can be five, six, seven years of difference, and presumably it comes down to you know, how, how the perception of the person who is actually um, making the record. But uh, as I say, un unfortunately, with Harriet Wildman, up to now, uh, no. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have anything more on her, but thanks. Um, Matt Stallard. 
Hi, sorry I don't have my uh, camera on, but uh, I'm looking after my Wi-Fi connection. Sorry for any background noise. Um, but thank you, Suzanne. Um, the level of detail work required to piece all of those sources together and, and you know reconstruct those stories is so like fantastically beautiful in the haystack and uh takes so much time and patience and expertise like i'm just blown away by how much detail we've been able to pull together there i would like to ask about the memorial that we can see on the presentation and particularly thinking about how the registers were created and particularly that the vast majority of people who are recorded there, the only information we have is a name that's been imposed by an enslaver. And they're almost like a cipher of a life. And I'm just wondering about the importance of memorialization in the way in which we approach this as a, as a public history um, exercise in front of research to talk about uh, and, and the specific memorial at the team. Okay, so I, mi I missed a couple bits of that, but I think I got the, the gist, Matt. So you can tell me at, when we're done if there's anything uh, that I missed out. Uh, there, there have basically been two, two pieces of memorialization done in relation to persons at the Papine estate. Uh, the first was uh, prior to and in 2007, when um, the university had a, a program going in relation to transformation and they made some funds available to an ad hoc, ad, ad hoc heritage committee that I was doing some work with. And we were able to put together a commemoration of the major populations on the site of the University Mona campus, as well as some signage in relation to some of the structures that remain. And so two of the, two of the monuments, two of the obelisks that exist, and you see it here on the bottom right-hand corner, is um, one was for the Papine estate, and it's up. Uh, if anybody who knows the, the Mona, UW, UWI Mona campus, it's up near the new medical faculty building, but it's towards the hospital. It's in the north of the, the campus site. And the Mona estate, we also did a similar one. And what we tried to do was really, I think, in the context of overcoming slavery. And so instead of trying to simply go through the returns and list every name that we could find. What we did was we worked through to identify persons who would still have been alive on the estate in 1832. Um, and basically we did that by taking the 1817 return and going through all the increase and, re and decrease records that were done triennially from 1817 up to 1832 adding anybody who was born or otherwise added to the estate, subtracting anybody who had died, been transported in one case that I'm aware of. Um, there were no sales, but there were certain persons sent to other wild money estates. So um, we ended up with these lists of persons who we believe were alive in 1832 and hence by very likely would at the very least have seen the abolition of slavery in 1834. Um, and those were the persons whose names are inscribed on that memorial, that obelisk that you see on the right hand side. The obelisk is made of cut limestone, which is um, native, which well, it's not native. The, the one we were able to use in this situation was not native to the property, but cut limestone. Um, was common on the property and was used uh, in making the um, aqueduct, which, as I said, cuts across and served both the Papine and then the Mona estate. Uh, so in each instance, and in the case of this obelisk, there is some information relating to the estate. And then there are lists of uh, the men and boys, women and girls, who were still alive in 1832 and who had been enslaved for whatever period on those estates. Um, 
So those two images that you see on the bottom right uh, are, are from that obelisk. And that is located in what would have been the village location on the, on the Papine estate. And I think one of the, one of the wonderful things uh, at Mona up to now is that that area of that estate has so far been relatively undisturbed. Uh, certainly the area between the aqueduct and the aqueduct road, which, which now cuts up from the, from the campus up, on, up to the hospital. Um, so that would have been part of that eight acre area that I talked about around the works and then to the north of the works where the village, is, the village would have been. And there, that's where the archeological work, a lot of the archeological work that has been done was, was done. The, the, the in memoriam sign that you see to the left is the one that was put together in 2012. Uh, no, it was put together after the 2012 uh, discovery of the burials uh, during the work that was being done for the Faculty of Medical Sciences. Um, and so basically there, the, the fragments of bone that were um, disturbed from the burials were gathered together uh, and inurned and a memorial put up. In principle, it's actually in line of sight to the obelisk, um, to the obelisk that recognizes the population of the village. But uh, unfortunately, you, you kind of there's a fence in the way, <laughs> so you the line of sight is not as as clear as one would like. But um, but yes, so that memorial basically uh, seeks to 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 respect and. Um, and to recognize and to help return to the location, the persons who were not only um, born, lived and, and died in that location. So yeah, I hope that answers your question, Matt. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, uh, James Dawkins has a question. Hi there. Hi, Thanks. Hi there, Suzanne. You, you can hear you. me. Yes. You, you as well. Thank you so much for a really, really interesting um, presentation on Papine. Um, amazing, uh, the work that you're doing. And I have, I guess, two questions that, that come out. I just want to answer one in the interest of time. But the first one is, do any people on uh, the enslaved people on Papine. Um, do they in any of the island's local newspapers with regards to, you know, uh, as, as uh, you know, runaways? Um, and if so, what have you been able to, to glean from them on that? Okay, so, so yes, there are, there are some, um, there are some mentions of Papine runaways. One of the things that's interesting about it, because we know so little about the, um, the, ge the geographical origins of the Papine, location, um, Papine population. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of broad understanding of where people are coming from, but among the runaways, there are actually some uh, tribal references, which may or may not be accurate to some of the people in the workhouses. Um, I would say maybe, if, maybe six or seven people. Um, and I don't, I don't have it open. Um, I know Mandingo is one of, the, is one of them. Uh, there, are, there are a few others. And in addition to that, there are a few um, actual, actual ads. So some appear in terms of the workhouses, the lists of persons who have been uh, held in workhouses. And some are actually in, in ads. And they are, it's interesting because the ads um, are as far as the Cronwell Chronicles. So they, they obviously felt that these people had, had left the vicinity in St. Andrew and, and gone west. Um, and the, there, the other thing that I would mention is that after slave evidence began to be um, accepted, there is at least one uh, advert, one, one newspaper report 
uh, from that uh, late 20s, early 30s period of a, I, I, I'm trying to remember the details, but it's, I think it's uh, an Obia man who goes uh, to do some work at Mona. And then there is evidence relating to that, uh, to exactly what was being done and what happened. Um, there are a couple of people whose names are, are mentioned and I can find them in the returns. Uh, unfortunately, I know very little more about them. There's one, um, one man who was, um, had run away. Uh, he's actually mentioned in a memorandum sent by one of the governors to the colonial office. Uh, but interestingly, he's not transported. Even though he's mentioned as an intractable runaway, he's still listed on that memorial, to, which shows that he was still alive in 18. 32 and on the estate. Wow. Uh, so there is, there is some material that exists, but it certainly in relation to these persons that I've tried to talk a bit about, there isn't anything else that is, that is providing us information on them. And um, much of it is, is hard to link from the person who is on the return to anybody else that we've been able to find. It's very, sure. it's very, um, it's very frustrating sometimes. Sure. No, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm doing, I'm doing, engaged in the same kind of process of tracing these enslaved people from, uh, you know, states that I'm working on. And I kind of, you know, I, I get the, uh, the, the issues that you, uh, challenges that you're encountering. Um, I do have another question, but I'll wait. I think there's someone else who wants to, to, if we've got some okay. time, I'll, throw a question in there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, James. Um, we'll go to um, L. Williams um, and then Matthew Smith. Yes, just a quick question. Uh, how much of the existing uh, um, landmarks are you able to relate to the previous uh, plantations? For example, is the at aqueduct roughly division between Mona and uh, Papine Estates, and what about the existing um, uh, uh, Mona um, uh, uh, residences, I mean, besides the university campus? Can you tell us a little bit about where things might be expected to be located, the, the, the Great House, for example, of Papine, and so on? Thank you. Okay, so thanks for the question. Um... We've, there are actually a number of signs put up around the Mona campus, which try to tell part of the story and identify whatever uh, structures remain. In terms of Papine, Papine and, and Mona were actually uh, separated by what is now called Shed Lane, uh, and at the time was called uh, the Road to Hall's Delight. And that's this kind of, um, uh, broken line that you see coming along at the sort of near the bottom of the of the the survey that uh, I have up on the screen so below numbers 14 and 26 coming along and going up and so essentially Papine and Mona are, se are separated by a road um, the aqueduct joins them the, so the aqueduct actually comes from the Hope Estate it comes into Papine in what's now the hospital, the, the university hospital. And there was a, a reservoir there. Um, and then the water was sent down uh, from, from there across the Papine land to the mill and then went underground and rose again on Mona Estate. Uh, if, any, if, if it's anybody who knows, if you know the campus uh, in the area where the, the bank um, and the Senate House and so on are. That's where the aqueduct rises again and then it comes down. So there is some of the uh, Mona estate works still there behind the university chapel, if you're familiar with the site. Um, in terms of Papine, uh, there are structures still available, still, still there. So there are the ruins of the mill um, are, still, are still present. You can see the, the wheel well where the, where the 12 foot uh, overshot water wheel would have turned uh, to to mill the cane that would have been brought in on the on the the side of that structure and and that is still present and some of the 
what would have presumably been the boiling and curing hose, there are um, not very obvious elements of it uh, still left on the site. Along the, uh, the aqueduct, there's also a cistern that, that remains and uh, some archeological work was done in that area. And, and, and I really wish that, that we could do more uh, to see whether there is enough information there for deeper analysis in terms of, of actual locations of, of where people live, but, but right now, no. In terms of the great houses, the overseer's house is not there anymore. The overseer's house would have been where the Mona School of Business, for those of you who know the Mona campus, that was the area where that was located. The great house would, the Papin great house would have fallen under what is now Irving Hall, which is the most easterly um, of the halls in that section uh, around where it goes under the, the, the main road outside of the campus. Um, we have a sign there that indicates that. There, that has been so built over that I don't think there's any chance of anything being found that one could, could really um, interpret in any sensible way. In terms of Mona, it's kind of interesting because the maps show us a great deal. And Mona um, seems to have had two great houses. The current Mona great house uh, was a second was a second great house, and there was a previous great house which is, is in the area now termed College Common. Which, for those of you do, who don't know, across the the main road from the university campus, the Mona campus, is where the main housing of the university is. And there is actually a site, and we did some uh, Dax and the university did some preliminary work at that site in what would have been um, the great house during this period uh, when Wildman was on Papin's side and, um, and the Mona was otherwise, was otherwise owned. I believe that there was probably a flooding issue that led to, uh, and, and neither, of the, neither that Mona nor the Papin great house were great houses in the sense that we've come to kind of understand great houses. Um, Wildman talks about the great house that his father had as, um, just a bit better than the houses that his enslaved population were, were living in, which, uh, which suggests that it may have been a wattle, um, that it may actually have been Spanish walled or uh, a, one of those sort of traditional uh, structures, not cut stone or anything of the sort. Uh, when, when Lady Nugent visited it, in 1802 or 1804, she says it was very low, set very low under the mountain and not at all interesting. Uh, what she was impressed by was the garden, which presumably Joanna Wildman, uh, James Beckford Wildman's mother would have, would have put together while she was in residence there. Um, so yeah, those are the structures that the, remain, but it's, it's the, the aqueduct actually links the two estates. It's the shed lane um, is the road that divides them. Thank you, Susan. That was really, really incredible. And I, I just want to echo what everyone else has been saying about you know, how impressive this detailed work is in reconstructing these lives. We, we do a lot of this work at the center and we know it's not easy work. And in many ways we aspire to get that level of detail that you presented. I just have a very quick question. Um, it, one th is, it's sort of related to the names. I, I think about Wildman Street in Kingston downtown and the mm -hmm. connection there and also the Gagan name. Um, and thanks to Julie Meeks who, who in the chat gave us the, the pronunciation for it. Um, I, I couldn't help thinking about the connection to the Marant Day Rebellion in 1865. One of the kind of instigating moments was uh, the trial that took place, um, I think three days before the actual march to the courthouse. And part of the issue, there was a man named Gagan who was um, arrested or, or a warrant was issued for his arrest for disrupting the proceedings. And so that leads me to the other to, to what's really my question, which is, you know, you talk about the richness of the sources and what it can reveal. And then you also mentioned the frustration. And I wonder if there's a frustration in trying to follow these people after 1832. 
And I imagine that there's a temptation to draw all of these links. But how do you sort of attend to that, that particular challenge? Because it's a very different set of records we have in Jamaica after, after emancipation. Matthew, thanks so much for the question, because, I mean, for me, one of the, the interesting aspects of, you know, this, this whole issue of reclamation and, and trying to bring people back to a space, you, you know, is how far you can, how far you can take it. So the records are, are slim in most, in most instances, especially, as I said, at locations like Papine, where there are no estate records because the, the estate records provide um, and the correspondence provides a, a far greater um, archive from which from which to dig and perhaps more on on some of these these persons um, so so can, you know it's in it becomes a sort of family history um, family history situation turned on its head I I have tried with with some of the persons who I've been able to, to locate and to, to find um, baptismal names or names and surnames for, to actually go to the, the further records. So from 1832, that's pretty much in Jamaica, the end of the, the, the returns, uh, abolition comes, emancipation comes, you can trace some of that uh, again, through the church registers. Um, but after, after 1838, or, and even before, in some instances, the reference to the, to the estate to which people were connected disappears from the church records in, in large, to, to a large extent. And so in terms of being sure that we're talking about the same people, um, you know, that, that can be itself itself a bit of a challenge from that perspective of, of trying to follow those stories forward. In the years after emancipation, there is a huge gap in terms of records of people, in terms of records of, of birth and, and, you know, even where presumably people are getting, are being born, are being perhaps baptized, perhaps married, etc. Uh, the records are not always, always there. Um, and while I think Jamaica has quite an amazing bank of, of records that have, have been kept and have continued to exist, whatever their, their shortcomings may be, there are periods when there is very, very little. And the period between emancipation and uh, the coming of civil registration in, seven, in 1878 to 1880 is a real pit and sometimes a, a very difficult one to get through in terms of, of tracing anybody, anybody back. So there's an extent to which luck also plays in to, to, the, to, the, to the story. Thanks, thanks, Susan. Thanks so much. Um, I think we have uh, just about out of time. Um, Thank you so much to everybody who asked those um, fantastic questions. Um, and it's great also to see some some really good kind of uh, really positive feedback and and um, interesting observations in the chat as well. Um, so thank you everybody for um, attending today's uh, public lecture. And thank you particularly, of course, to Suzanne Francis Brown for her um, fantastic lecture. Um, I don't know if we can all sort of unmute ourselves and applaud her. <laughs> Um, I'll do the kind of, uh, I see Matthew Salads doing the um, applause emoji for us. Um, uh, thank you all very much. Um, and thanks again to Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Very nice. Cheers. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you.